Welcome back for our first uh, session of paper presentations. We have two kinds of papers that are going to be presented. Uh, the first are 15 minute presentations and we'll have five minutes for questions afterwards. Of course, you can always talk to people during the breaks and poster session. Uh, and then after those three pr uh, presentations, we're going to have a series of five minute presentations that were shorter. Uh, and there won't really be that much time for questions immediately after each of those. So hold your questions on those. And if we have a little time after that before lunch, uh, you, we can field a few questions on those. So uh, first up, uh, I'd like to introduce uh, Sophia, and I'm, I'm not going to try to pronounce her last name. Um, she's going to talk about search as you think and think as you search. Uh, so, my name is Sophia Klenikus, and actually the one that I'm presenting today is my dissertation project, to be precise, my second <coughs> dissertation project, and it was completed, and so actually today my dissertation advisor, Dr. Sherlyn, is also attending, so I'm going to present, and you can ask a difficult to ask <laughs> questions to him, so we are dividing the labor. <laughs> so, but anyway... Before I begin, I have to tell you that I had the worst flight of my life uh, last night because I was sitting next to a baby that was crying nonstop for six hours. And then the flight arrived, uh, took off two hours late, of, of course, it arrived two hours late, so I hardly uh, slept. And then I came today and I was hoping to eat something when Dr. Kulis suggested that the workshop was starting in a few minutes. So I had to give up my precious free breakfast. So as you can see, I'm sick and tired and hungry, but I will try to do my best. <laughs> So, oh, but before I begin, I, I really thank the anonymous uh, reviewers who reviewed my uh, our papers uh, and gave uh, helpful comments. And the, my regret is that I could not actually incorporate the comments into the final version of the paper because, let's face it, I have only four pages, and if I add something, I have to take out something. So, but hopefully, in the journal version of the paper, I can uh, elaborate. So today my outline is introduction, research problem, and conceptual framework, and semantic knowledge base. But of course the focus will be uh, semantic search interface and information retrieval evaluation. And conclusion, acknowledgement, and publication. So introduction, just in case you are not familiar with this project. So my objective in this project was to demonstrate uh, uh, utility and feasibility and effectiveness of entity and facts retrieval, and I'm going to explain that later. And approach it, I extracted semantic knowledge using Wikipedia, and based on that, I constructed a semantic search interface. An application domain, I used a film domain as a sample domain of the application. <laughs> and so the products of these uh, projects are semantic knowledge base and semantic search interface, but I won't get into the details of the first parts, but only focus on the interface today. And finally, the results uh, through the evaluation, the effectiveness of entity facts extraction and uh, retrieval have been confirmed. So what was the research problem? Actually, it's also about backgrounds, motivation, and research problems. So my basic point is that uh, humans think uh, about things and make sense of things largely by virtue of classifying things into different classes. So when we understand something, we already know what kinds of things there are, and our knowledge or understanding of the kinds of things already informs of us of the kinds of things that we ask or seek about things. So in that sense, the ontological structure of the world in the human thinking constitutes the basis of the semantic structure of sense making. And a significant kind of information seeking activity is concerned with uh, asking about things. We want to find some things that have certain attributes. And when we uh, seek a, uh, search for uh, those kinds of things, we already know what kinds of things we are looking for. And because we already know what kinds of things we are looking for, we only ask relevant questions. So in this sense, the ontological structure and semantic structure constitute the basis of information seeking. But uh, the keywords-based interface uh, actually separates this uh, two process of uh, uh, information seeking and sense making in the sense that the query string 
is decomposed into individual keywords. And then as a result, you get the documents, not the entities or things themselves as a result. So the query and you get the results as the list of documents. So what I wanted to do was to go to the direct entity retrieval and not just any entity retrieval, but what I call type and condition specified entity retrieval. So the user can specify type of the entities and also the conditions to be satisfied by those entities. And as a result, you get the uh, list of uh, entities directly as a result of your query, not just a list of documents. So the problem is how to enable this kind of entity facts re retrieval effectively that goes uh, away from the words-based document-centric and indirect information retrieval to the meaning-based entity-centric and direct information retrieval. And conceptual framework. So um, I will also uh, explain very briefly about this part. So by entity, I mean thing of any kind that it has certain attributes. Attributes is a property of an entity. And what do I mean by type? Uh, type is a generic class in the ontology of uh, entities under which an entity is classified. And by entity subtype, I mean the most specific class under which an entity is classified. And in my project, I represented fact as an uh, entity, attribute, value, and note tuple. So this uh, is, uh, there is an addition of note field to the uh, standard uh, subject predicate object model. So for notes, I use to uh, save and also retrieve relevant contextual information about this entity attribute value uh, triple. And by semantic condition, I mean attribute and value pair. So all the things in my project in this project have been uh, classified according to the ontology. So the at top top level there is a thing, and then the uh, level one we have person, work, organization, blah blah blah. And of course each of these uh, level one classes are also classified more. So like a concept, it becomes artwork related concept and something else. And it is also further classified, further classified, and so on. So by type, I mean the level one class. And by subtype, I mean the most specific leaf class in the ontology. So um, the first part, so actually, this project is a two-winged project. So uh, one main part is the information extraction part, knowledge extraction part. And another part is information retrieval and evaluation part about this uh, effective minutes of interface. So uh, I will not go into the details of the extraction process. I will just briefly show the results of extraction. So I used uh, the film pages in Wikipedia and other uh, film awards related pages in Wikipedia. And this is the extraction result. And also, um, one point about this extraction in my project is that I did not use just to directly extract information that is in Wikipedia, but also a major part was indirectly derived knowledge based on the knowledge already extracted. So these, fig these figures actually contain both those that have been directly extracted and those that have been either derived or uh, devised. So there are, for example, 209 thousand entities and there are about two million entity centric facts and of course you can also see the numbers of each different types of entities and uh, so today's focus is to, uh, on the semantic search interface so this is the interface I created and uh, as you can see, there, is, uh, there are tabs for different kinds of search functions. And there's also a page uh, that has the user instructions. So I uh, implemented uh, different kinds of semantic search functions for entity facts retrieval and general entity retrieval query. This is the main function that I am, I am aimed at demonstrating. And by using this, the user can retrieve entities that specifically match uh, the entity type, subtype, and conditions, semantic conditions, that is, attribute value pairs that the user entered. But you, uh, the user can also use the specific entity-centered query to retrieve a
facts about a specific entity. And there is an entity commonality for the query where the user can find commonalities between two specified entities of the same type and subtype. And there is a direct relation find the query. Uh, the user can use this function to find relations between two entities regardless of their uh, type and subtype. And also, there is an indirect relation find the query. So the user can uh, find indirect relations between two specified entities that are mediated by a third entity. And finally, there is a browsing function, category-based entity browsing, so the user can browse uh, film entities according to the hierarchical category structure. So I will focus on the general entity retrieval query. So how the process works, in the main menu, the user selects search type and choose a general entity retrieval query. And then the uh, first thing that the user does is to select entity type. Once the user selects entity type, the next step is to select the subtype under the given type. Once the user does that, then the next thing to do is to specify an attribute. And once you specify an attribute, then you need to specify value. And of course, this uh, process of specifying attributes and value, specifying this condition can be repeated. So once the user is finished with the, uh, this process, then the user can submit query, and then the user will get the query results. And the query results uh, does not uh, just consist of a list of entity names, but it also uh, has uh, relevant contextual information. Furthermore, the user can also click on any entity name highlighted, not just those in the direct answers, but also in the contextual information to get the uh, information about the selected entity, and of course, this uh, can also be uh, repeated. So this is actual, uh, actually interface. So let's say with general entity retrieval query, you can retrieve all entities that directly match your queries. So user clicks the button, and this is what the user sees. The user does not see the whole form like, but only sees the first relevant options. So the user needs to select an entity type. So if the user clicks it, and then the user sees the list of entity types, and user chooses one. Then what happens is that now the user is uh, uh, given the menu for the entity subtype selection. And the entity subtype selection menu only contains those relevant options according to the user selection of the in the previous step. So you will not see like a some subtypes that are relevant to person type entity when you, cho when you have chosen the concept type entity. And in case of person, actually, uh, uh, uses, uh, the interface simplifies the selection so that the user can just say any. Once the user does that, then you get the so, uh, menu for the attribute selection. And again, the menu only contains those uh, attributes that are relevant to the given uh, chosen entity type and subtype. So once the user chooses that, and so in this case, uh, directed film is the attribute because there are so many films in the database. So actually, the input box first appears so that the user can type something to get the suggestion. But in case uh, there are only a few values, or only like a few hundred values, then the menu uh, directly appears. So we are, in this case, uh, the user is seeking to find the films that have won awards, and the user wants to specify what awards it was. So the user selects Academy Awards for Best Picture, and then as soon as the user uh, specifies at least one condition, then the user can submit query. Or at this step, the user can add another condition to be satisfy the entities, or the user can remove the last condition and specify. Two minutes left? Two minutes left. Oh, OK. So this is what the user <laughs> sees as a result. Anyway, so evaluation, actually, I wanted to go into the evaluation. So, the evaluation method that I used a comparison between uh, Internet Movie Database and my interface for comparison. And why did I use the Internet Movie Database? Uh, uh, because of the domain orientation of the project. So all subjects had to use both interfaces, and we compared the results. 
So the design is that uh, the the user, well, uh, the user group was divided into six groups, so they could uh, start with the My Interface or IMDB first, or also the questions were uh, presented in a different order. Okay. Some of the questions I want to show you. So. The questions asked like uh, entities, so who played all of these roles? But uh, that's not the whole question. The whole question is, once you find that, give me the name of the actor and the titles of the films and so on, so on. So the user had to find not only the entities, but also related entities or some related information. And in this, uh, in this case, it was, yeah, in this case also like this. So that's why I used uh, when I, uh, calculated precision and recall, it was uh, said to be based on the uh, weighted correctness score because the user had to find, of course, the entity names, but also some contextual information. So the uh, effectiveness was measured by uh, precision and recall based on the weighted correctness score. And the hypothesis was that uh, the per subject average precision and recall will generally be higher, but I was not sure whether it will be always higher. But uh, per group precision and recall, I thought that it was way higher. And it has been confirmed. I have no time for this. I will just show the main result. So uh, this is the main result. So the user was uh, given 10 questions, and they did uh, work on five questions on IMDb and on five questions in Pananthropon. And the result is the average precision recall was uh, substantially higher on the Pananthropon interface. And per subject, average precision greater than 90%, or there were several uh, in the group. And for all, uh, all the subjects, the uh, per, subject, uh, per subject have uh, average precision recall is higher for the Pananthropon interface versus the IMDb interface. And this is the post uh, task questionnaire responses. So the only one person said that the IMDb was effective. In contrast, <laughs> uh, on, uh, almost all subjects agreed that the Pananthropon was uh, effective. Also, they said that they could easily understand and use Pananthropon. And uh, furthermore, they were also interested in using similar interfaces. So, in terms of relative effectiveness, they all agreed that the Pananthropon was more. And why they thought that the Pananthropon was effective? The user liked the fact, uh, the subjects like the fact that they don't need to guess the right keywords to use, and they also like the step-by-step -step search process. And they thought that actually they could easily understand the entity types, subtypes, and attributes. And they liked the fact that they can actually search for specific things precisely by specifying multiple conditions, and so on, so on. Yes, this is the conclusion. So actually, the evaluation results uh, actually show that uh, the interface was effective, uh, at least for the uh, subjects. And because I had to skip the parts, but actually the subjects were general subjects. They were uh, mostly undergraduate students, but they did not uh, actually major in information science or in so on. But uh, there were various groups like a biological engineering, biology, mechanical engineering, and so on. And future work, uh, I'd like to apply this approach to other domains. In and yeah, this uh, research has been partially supported by the 2011 Eugene Garfield the doctoral research. So I think we might have time for maybe one. <laughs> so sorry. Yeah, I mean, that was, uh, I did not uh, focus on actually uh, devising. Uh, the, the, the focus of, uh, actually, they came from, I devised the questions, but my focus was to see the, uh, the kinds of queries that they can, in principle, be answered. Because IMDb has all the information about the, all the films. So mm -hmm. the questions are, in principle, answered by IMDb, but it is hardly actually practicable when you, really do that. So I wanted to show that. So 
I tried to be non-biased, but still I had to show the difference. Otherwise, there is no point of uh, creating a new kind of interface if it is uh, just as... Okay, uh, thank you very much. Thank you. 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 Next up, um, we have Chang Lu from Rutgers University, and she's going to present a paper called Exploring the Effect of Past Difficulty and Domain Knowledge on Dwell Times. And uh, I understand this is some work that she did with Michael Cole, Falcon, and Gaston. Good morning, I'm Chang Liu from Rutgers University. So I'm presenting this work on behalf of our Poodle project. This is our part of our exploratory um, study on this issue. So the topic of our study is exploring the effect of task difficulty and domain knowledge on dwell times. I know all these uh, variable names are very familiar to our audience and uh, uh, so we are talking about dual, uh, uh, domain knowledge, and we are talking about task difficulty, and we are also talking about dual times. Many researchers have done this, but uh, I hope, uh, we hope our research will add something new to what al we already know and maybe provide some unexpected results. So let's go first briefly go through what we already know. With respect to the task difficulty effect, we, uh, some reasons uh, study have found that users tend to issue more diverse queries, uh, spend longer time on search result pages, and use advanced uh, operators more and spend larger proportion of task time on search result pages when they are working in difficult tasks. And in another study, uh, that we have done, we examined task type and task difficulty together. So in that study, we found when users were searching for single fact uh, finding task, uh, in difficult task, they are uh, they tend to have longer total dwell time and longer first dwell time on unique content pages. But there's no significant difference on the dwell time on search result pages. Well, on the other type of task, especially when users are searching for multiple facts or general information gathering, um, we have we found the other pattern. So users tend to have longer dwell time on search result pages, but there was no significant uh, difference between dwell time on search uh, on content pages in diff difficult and easy task. So e e our current study uh, will ask. Us uh, participant to search multiple information, in, uh, general information gathering. We will compare this result later. Uh, with respect to domain knowledge effect, um, we, uh, there are a lot of research, and uh, something related to what we are doing here uh, is that uh, users with low domain knowledge, they have less efficient query uh, terms and less efficient query tactics. Uh, and uh, Kelly and Ku also found that when searchers' topic familiarity increase, their reading time decrease. That means their dwell time on uh, content pages decrease. And their search efficacy um, is increased, defined as the ratio of number of documents saved to the number of documents they viewed in the task. And, and a recent study by um, a group of Microsoft researchers, they found that it depends in different domains. So in medical and law, law domain, they found experts had longer average page display time than non-experts. I think the display time here is very related to the dwell time con on content pages. And in finance and computer science domain, they found the other pattern that experts had shorter average page display time than non-experts. In our study, we will have uh, participants from medical domain, so we can also compare our results with their results in medical domain. Okay, uh, so in order to address this question, we have we conduct a user study in which we um, recruit 40 students from medical domain. Um, and when they first come to our experiment, we uh, give them a background questionnaire in which we collect their background information, computer experience, search experience. More important, we evaluate their domain knowledge through the, uh, their reaping on their knowledge of selected mesh terms. I will talk about that briefly. 
later. And then we gave them a demo of training task how to use our system. Uh, after that, we gave them four search tasks. Um, and during each task, they are given uh, up to 15 minutes to search, and they can save useful documents that were related to this task. Uh, after that, they have exit questionnaire and uh, all their interactions with computers were logged by our uh, logging system. So this is the way that we measure their domain knowledge. We give them um, three match, tree, match trees, that's uh, to, to, in total to 409 terms associated with the topic categories we will ask them to search in our task. So these topics are like genetic extract uh, structures, genetic processes, uh, genetic phenomena. These are, um, so for each term, we ask them to um, evaluate how, how much you know about this term from one to five, that is from no knowledge to five that I can explain to others. And then we add all their ratings together, um, that is the top. So we add all their ratings and whether some of them were not rated. So if they have read that term, we add them together. And then divide it by, um, by this number that is to normalize um, their ratings by an ex hyper hypothesized uh, expertise who will rate all the terms as five. Um, so that five um, plus the number of terms they rated in that, um, in that questionnaire. And then um, participants were divided uh, into two groups by the median, uh, that's 0 0.4, uh, into high domain knowledge group and low domain knowledge group. And also we control their task difficulty. Um, the way that we control their task difficulty is uh, defined, the, so hard task was defined as um, the number of um, let me put it this way. So hard task means the, there are very few relevant documents uh, returned uh, when we have their topic as a query issued into the system as per season 10. So, um, so in our task design, we control the task type. And then in this figure shows the user's reading about task difficulty, and that's to confirm our design of task difficulty. So you can see that among the five tasks we have, uh, topic seven and topic four have a uh, lower rating than the others. So, um, we, so we have two groups of tasks uh, with uh, easy task and uh, difficult task. Now we look at the results. First, we look at the, these factors on the dwell time of on content pages. And since um, users are searching for content page to accomplish this task, and they will save some documents that were re related to, that were useful to their task. So we also consider document useful into, in this model. And document usefulness would defined as whether this page has been saved by the user. And this is the, uh, the result from general linear model. And we can see that only usefulness has a um, main effect uh, on their dwell time on content pages. And we also find there is an interaction effect of task difficulty and domain knowledge. So let's look at them one by one. First, surprisingly, users spend much longer time on viewed pages than on saved pages. That is um, quite different with what we already know. Some st study have found that, um, most of study I have said that um, if there's a relationship, users tend to spend longer time on useful pages than non-useful pages. Oh, they are not significant dif uh, relationship. But here we found the different pattern. So users spend longer time on non-useful pages than useful pages. And then let's look at the interaction effect. I think this is more surprising. Um, so the red line stands for the low domain knowledge, the blue line, high domain knowledge. So we can see that um, in easy task, actually users with high domain knowledge spend much, much longer time on content page than users with low domain knowledge. And there is not significant difference when they are working for difficult task. And in particular, if we compare dwell time on content page in difficult task with 
easy task only focusing on users with high domain knowledge, they themselves spend longer time in difficult task, uh, in easy task than in difficult task. So after that, we continue to examine the, the effect of these two factors on their dwell time on search result pages. And uh, here, we only found that um, task difficulty and domain knowledge level have main effect here, and there's no interaction effect. So if you look at this figure, these two lines are parallel. Uh, so for all users, when they are uh, working for hard, difficult tasks, their dwell time on search result pages is longer than easy tasks. And for users with high domain knowledge, um, they spend a shorter dwell time on search result pages than users with low domain knowledge. And we put these together so that we can compare uh, their dwell time on search result pages and uh, their dwell time on um, content pages. So um, I think if when we look at this figure, the, the, the dot lines re represent the dwell time on SERPs. And um, the solid line stands for their dwell time on uh, content pages. So if we look at only uh, users with low domain knowledge, the two lines with, in red, we can see that in difficult tasks, users with low domain knowledge, they spend longer dwell time on content, both content page and search result pages. And then if we look at users with high domain knowledge, the blue line here, we see the different pattern that uh, in easy task, users with high domain knowledge spend much longer dwell time on content pages than on search result pages. But in difficult task, they spend longer time on search result pages than on content pages. So that is our finding. And now uh, let's discuss. So one of the unexpected result is why users with high domain knowledge uh, spend much longer time on content pages in easy task than in difficult task. Um, we don't know the exact answer. And one of the um, explanation could be the way we define task difficulty. So hard tasks were defined as tasks where search system returned few relevant documents using the task description at the query. So in the search result pages in difficult tasks, they have very few relevant documents showed there. So it is possible that users with high domain knowledge they already made the document usefulness judgment on the search result pages. And then when they get go through in that particular content page, they just go and save the page. That is one, uh, uh, one, one explanation. But for users with low domain knowledge, they, they, they still need some time to read the documents and then make the final decision. So then we can compare our study with previous study for some task difficulty. Um, so in previous study th that we did, we found uh, there's no significant difference on dwell time of all content pages. So if maybe our uh, study could help explain that uh, maybe the health, uh, the, no, the domain knowledge the, has an interaction effect with task difficulty. So they did not find significant difference between easy and difficult tasks, but there might be some difference uh, between people with high and low domain knowledge. And with respect to um, the dwell time on search result pages, uh, both these studies found users spend longer time on search result pages in difficult tasks than easy tasks, and we also confirmed that. Um, so users tend to stay, to stay longer time on search result pages when they are searching for difficult tasks. So compared with dwell time on content pages, maybe dwell time on search result page uh, could be a better indicator of task difficulty and also ta uh, domain knowledge. And uh, if we compare that with um, the results um, in domain knowledge effect, actually the, our results were different. And we are not quite sure. Maybe the task difficulty has some interaction effect here. So here comes to our conclusion. Um, that is, uh, users spend longer time on search result pages in difficult tasks than in easy tasks. And um, users with low domain knowledge um, spend longer time um, on search result pages than users with high domain knowledge. 
uh, and dwell time on content page has shows an uh, interaction effect by the um, task difficulty and domain knowledge. And also, I have to mention that uh, it is possible that users spend longer time in non-useful pages than useful pages. So we found that our study, the result from our study may not be generalized. It may depend on our design of uh, task and uh, the design of our system. But uh, th this is what we found, and we would like to discuss this uh, with the audience here. We got very good reviews here, uh, and we would like to continue to do this, and uh, it is, it especially examine the relationship between the dwell time on content page with the dwell time on search result page to fully understand how users search in very difficult tasks. Thank you very much. So you mean um, the total time they worked on the task may affect their search behaviors. Um, you, yeah, you have up to 15 minutes to search, and actually these tasks are very difficult. And uh, in, in our um, data collection, we found most of users use uh, all the times, so 15 minutes. And maybe at the end, they were little by, a little bit hurry, and they want to save more. Um, maybe that could be an effect here. Thank you. Their domain knowledge. Uh, no, you assess their domain knowledge. You mm. assess their search skill. A uh, search skill. We also collected information about that, but um, I, I don't think we have analyzed. Do you, Do you have any, Michael? I don't know. Yeah, we have the data, but we haven't agonized. Uh, thank you for the suggestion. I think we we will um, try to see if that has an effect. Yeah, that could be a problem. Yeah, thank you. Just a, a suggestion is that you might actually look at varying the quality of the snippets as a way of forcing the effectiveness of the result pages. That's an interesting way to say with the variable of uh, that you're observing. Curious. Mm-hmm. I mean, the their search result for, yeah, on the search result page, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, we, we, we evaluate their search um, performance, but uh, their search performance is um, only focusing on whether they save that page. But uh, I think your question is about oh, their overall quality of the search result page, right? Specifically the snippet that allows for the Mm-hmm. The uh, SERP had uh, article citation. Yeah, yeah, that's good. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, so this is the uh, content page. Uh, they look at the abstract, and this is the search result page, and we have the, their title, uh, author, and the name of the journal. So uh, the only information that we, they can get more from content page is the abstract. Uh, yeah, I know. 
they just saved the uh, relevant document. Uh, that's an interesting question, but in fact, our <laughs> task were our task were boring. <laughs> Actually, um, so if you 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 are interested, I have task examples, and um, this is easy task and this is difficult task. These are from Track uh, 2004, and um, I have no idea what they are about. <laughs> so they are really domain uh, folk domain limited and uh, very, we only recruit students from medical domain so they can understand this and they are not searching for fun, they are searching for literature. So, so I, there's some great discussion here, I hate to cut it off, but we do need to move on, so I encourage you all to talk to uh, Right. so let's all thank you. Right. So uh, next up is uh, Jing Jing Lu, uh, who is at State University and also I guess with both partners. Um, and she's going to talk to us about knowledge examination in multi-session tasks. Okay. Hi everyone. Yes, um, as we just he heard uh, knowledge did have some effect in user search. So now here we have another paper <laughs> about it. This was um, using my uh, dissertation research data, but it uh, is a very different analysis from what I did before. Um, sorry, there is some uh, mismatch here on the. Anyhow. Uh, in this study, actually, we look at users' uh, um, self-assessed uh, knowledge uh, in a multi-session task, and uh, both before and after they work with the task, and both before and after they work with each subtopic of this multi-session task. And we just look at uh, you know the relationship between the, ta uh, the knowledge, these kinds of knowledge that I just mentioned, and see what is the pattern of them. And the finding is that users' knowledge of the general task and their uh, knowledge of the subtask topic, okay, they did have different values, uh, and also they have different patterns of change. And uh, some attributes of the task knowledge, but not all of them, varied across task types. This is just an overview. So why knowledge? <laughs> we know that knowledge is obviously um, an unavoidable uh, aspect when we uh, look at it, when we talk about information search. And uh, previous studies have found that, including the one that we just here, yeah, okay, the uh, users' knowledge they did affect users' search behavior and their search performance also. Uh, from even from uh, the starting point, they choose the use uh, they choose the uh, search terms, um, query terms how long the query is, and to reading the results page and uh, uh, even uh, the procedure and the recall and their you know, correctness of answer the questions, answer the tasks. So it's quite, um, um, quite uh, uh, obvious that knowledge affects users' behavior and their performance. And uh, in terms of the knowledge elicitation or assessment, there have been several um, different kinds of uh, methods used in previous studies. Um, for example, according to different stage of taking a course or taking or, or in a program, you know, the earlier stage probably corresponds to a lower knowledge, and later is uh, corresponds with a higher knowledge. Or you know, a person inside or outside of a domain. Um, corresponds to the novice and the experts. And even their answers to some kinds of questions in the test. Uh, some other uh, methods used are like uh, including um, reading the terms in a thesaurus or just simply to ask users to self judge how familiar are you with the topic. Okay. And uh, previous studies found that the fourth and the fifth are correlated with each other. And this study that I'm talking about, we use the fifth uh, method. Okay. So um, we know that knowledge is important. 
in uh, affecting users behavior so but we don't know that how knowledge change actually in the search process and uh, this is why we uh, had this research also because multi-session tasks are often seen in the people's life and also it is a very pretty handy way handy, uh, convenient way to assess users knowledge gain throughout the process why we are doing research and the specific questions uh, we uh, uh, tried to answer include that what is the pattern of users general knowledge uh, gen knowledge of the general topic and what is the pattern of users knowledge of the subtopic of the task and are there any difference between these two and uh, how uh, users how different task type would affect uh, users knowledge and uh, also, how does users' knowledge change across and within the different sessions? Okay. So as I mentioned, this was a, uh, this data set was coming from my dissertation research. So those who know about it and who were at ACES last week, uh, please be patient when I repeat this. <laughs> okay. So this study, we had 24 participants uh, from um, undergrad journalism and media studies uh, and they were paid and with bonus to encourage them to have a serious manner in searching and working on the task. Okay, half of them worked with the defending task and the other half worked with the parallel task. Just to explain further what are these two task types. They say that the task was that each participant, participant was asked to write a three section article in three sessions and each session with one topic okay in a parallel task they were asked to focus on the three topics of uh, um uh honda civic uh child camry and the nissan ultima but on the other hand in a dependent task the three subtopics were collecting information about hybrid cars and then select three models that uh, mainly focus on in the article and just compare and the, the pros and the cons of uh, each of the model. So you see the different structure here. One is parallel and the other is dependent. Okay. <coughs> I have clicked somewhere, but I cannot see. Okay, now back to the study design. As I said that this was a multi-session um, study, each user actually came three times. So three sessions, each session worked with one topic uh, of the three. And uh, uh, before and after each session, they were asked to complete a questionnaire. And in each questionnaire, they were elicited uh, uh, they were asked to self-reach their familiarity with the the uh, topic the, of the general task and uh, their familiarity with the topic of the subtask um, based on the seven point Likert skill. Uh, one is uh, um, not at all and seven is extremely. So here's how our data was elicited from. Okay, um, another factor in this study was actually a system version. So there were two systems versions uh, uh, involved one is called a term suggestion. This is how it looks like. You see that on the left side, there were some terms which suggest, uh, which suggest to the users. Um, another version, which is a non-term suggestion, it was just the blank IE window, just the right side, in the full size. Uh, in the study observation, actually, um, and uh, based on the interview afterwards, with uh, the participants rarely used those terms. So we think that this system, uh, in fact, does not uh, affect what our, what our current research is like. And we are not going to talk more about it. OK. Now let's look at the results. Uh, here is the results. Uh, showing in the graph about users' knowledge of the general task before and after each session for all three sessions. Now we see that 
like to increase uh, inside of each session. Uh, but we know that from the study, from the results, actually in session three, the difference was not sig significant. So it seems like in the previous two sessions, users gained knowledge on the general task topic, but in the third session, that they kind of reached a plateau and didn't uh, sub, uh, didn't uh, increase significantly. And uh, when we look at the between session comparison, we see that for the pre-task and the post-task, it seems like both uh, increased across sessions. And a post-talk analysis found that the difference was between session one and session three. So session two actually didn't significantly higher than session one, but session three was. Okay, so here is this part. Now we looked at uh, um, the um, knowledge of the general task again, but in two different tasks. One is in parallel. <coughs> and the other is independent. Now we see that actually um, for the, again, with, within session, in the dependent task, actually users' knowledge gained in all three sessions. But in the parallel task, which is below there, in session one and session three, uh, users' knowledge didn't gain, but in session two, they gained. So, one possibility is that actually we looked at the, the results. For the parallel task, in session one, users had a pretty high baseline, baseline knowledge. So that's why they didn't seem to gain uh, more knowledge in after that session. And session three of the parallel task, the pattern was the same as <coughs> as what we said, excuse me, as what we saw just now for the uh, in this slide. Okay, when we look at the between session thing, okay, for the dependent task, actually, the pre-task uh, and the, for the pre-task uh, pattern for both the dependent task and the parallel task was the same pattern as what we saw just now in this slide. But when we look at the post-session uh, general task knowledge, we see something different. So for the dependent task, actually, users' knowledge after the sessions, they increased across each session. But in the parallel task, they didn't seem to gain um, across any uh, session. There were no difference there. Okay, so we did further analysis using general linear model and just to have an overview of the task and the session effect. Now we see from these results, uh, the session effect was in accordance with what we just saw in the previous two slides. And about the task effect that was not seen in the previous uh, slide, actually we saw that um, the, for the pre-task knowledge, okay, dependent task users had lower knowledge than the parallel task. Although that after the, uh, the tasks, the post-session tasks, they too reached the same. It seems to correspond with what we just saw, but I'll uh, explain a little bit more uh, later. Okay. So now let's look at the subtask knowledge. So now we see that it's quite different from the um, general topic knowledge, and because the subtask topic they are different than um, different at each time. So the previous, uh, the pre-task, uh, pre-session knowledge actually they didn't seem to change at all and because uh, they are different. But post-knowledge, when we see that the session one and session three, there were a significant difference, possibly because the users, when they, get, when they get to the third session, they already got some knowledge about the general task. So they were higher in the topic uh, of the subtopic as well. Okay. Is this the um, same analysis in two tasks? We see that the uh, within session, they increase all the time, and between session, no difference at all. Okay. And again, this is a general linear model analysis, and we see that the session effect in, uh, was, in, uh, uh, was the same as what we saw just now, and task effect, no, not at all. So, 
pre and post, both tasks are the same. Now here's a summary of that, uh, the findings. First, about general and uh, subtask, um, we see that they are quite a different patterns. The general task knowledge, users seem to um, increase uh, within sessions, except for some exceptions, when they seem to reach the plateau. Um, but, uh, uh, and they seem to increase between sessions also. But for the subtask knowledge, they seem to increase within sessions, but not increase between sessions. And another thing that when we look at the parallel and dependent task, we see that we saw that for the general task knowledge, dependent task uh, users had lower knowledge than the parallel task, probably because parallel task um, seems easier. But in the process, okay, users didn't seem to gain knowledge in the parallel task, but they really gained knowledge in the dependent task. Until the end of the task, they reached the same level. Okay, so. Um, now, so what do these all suggest? We think that first we know that there are two different kinds of knowledge in such a, um, a, a complex study or complex task. We want to be sure what we are marrying. And also we see sometimes users could get a plateau or like a ceiling effect when they have a pretty high knowledge already. So they uh, work with another session will not supposed to uh, significantly increase their knowledge. And in study design, I think we want to try to avoid this effect. Also, uh, we see the difference in the uh, parallel and dependent task. The parallel task is kind of like an easy uh, when you read the task, but you didn't gain knowledge in the process. The, difficult, uh, the dependent task was on uh, a different uh, uh, it may seem very difficult in the beginning, but users actually gain knowledge. So in the end, they kind of uh, reach the same. So this uh, seems to indicate that what systems want to do to help users. Um, uh, if they have high uh, enough knowledge already, uh, what can the system do to help them gain more knowledge even? Uh, and also how to uh, help them to um, solve the task. Uh, so this is our uh, findings. and. Uh, thoughts. And uh, we also are open to all the other comments and the additional um, for our additional work. There it is. Thank you. Okay, uh, as I mentioned, actually, there are um, different ways to uh, different ways to measure and assess users' knowledge. And uh, uh, the one that we are using was used previously in other studies. Uh, this is one thing that we also you know, used the same method. And also, the second thing is that this method was found to be uh, correlated with users' ratio of their uh, familiarity with some thesaurus terms. We think that it's kind of not a purely objective, but uh, it's more objective than they just self-read my knowledge. Uh, we think this is a, a somehow reliable way to test users' knowledge. Because the thesaurus term, um, we know that not every domain has a thesaurus. Uh, for some domain, like, huh? Yeah, I, I hope we were able to find a thesaurus for the hybrid cars at that time. <laughs> but obviously, yes, I, I like your suggestion. And in future studies, we could also look at, uh, you know, uh, Use this kind of knowledge um, change using other kinds of methods to assess their knowledge. Uh, there was another study actually also out of the Ruggers uh, uh, group. 
and using the study you just heard by Chang Liu, we actually in the study we asked the users, the medical uh, participants, they come to reach their uh, familiarity with the thesaurus terms for, I think, like uh, biomedical, uh, ge what's the, genomic. Genomic. Genomics, uh, just taken from MESH, the medical subject heading directly uh, with the structure, the tree structure. And we ask the users to self assess their familiarity with those terms for each of the terms. And uh, we also, in, on the other hand, we ask them to uh, self-reach their familiarity with the task topic, just that, that, as you see from the previous paper. So we got both methods, and we looked at the correlation between the two ratings, and we found a high, uh, a very high correlation, probably eight or 90%. Okay, so next up we're going to move into our lightning round of uh, five-minute presentations. So we won't have time for questions after each of these. We might have time for a couple of questions at the end, right before lunch. Um, so first up is Mark Smucker from the University of Waterloo. He's going to talk about an analysis of user strategies for examining processing right list of documents. <laughs> That's a mouthful. Yeah, I guess I'm trying to put everything into the title, which is apropos for a five-minute talk. Um, yeah, so I'm Mark Smucker from the University of Waterloo. And when we have users and they come in and they do a search with a query, then they're presented with their results. And now they're faced with the task of examining and processing those results. And this is what I'm focusing on here today. I'm interested in questions about where do they spend their time? This is similar to the Rutgers work, okay? So where do they spend their time on the summaries? Where do they spend their time on the documents? And also, with what sort of accuracies do they operate on clicking on those summaries and also the judging of those documents? Now, to do this, we actually had previously a 48-participant user study. And in this user study, we asked the users to search for relevant documents and save them if they're relevant, okay? They were given prefixed lists of relevant documents, okay? So these were already manufactured for them and they were to search for them. And they had 10 minutes um, for each search topic that they worked on. We had a very basic um, user interface, instructions at the top, search topic on the right. Uh, there you go, 10 blue links or so. And uh, query by summaries, you can click on them, you get to view the full document. And uh, the documents would have query terms highlighted in them for the users. Uh, the user could then go ahead and, if they wanted to, say, oh, yes, yeah, save it as a relevant document. This is not a required judgment, uh, but it is that's how they would do it. Then when they're done with the page, simple back button to go back to the results, continue searching for relevant documents. And when they, uh, if they wanted to, they could certainly go 10 more results and 10 more results. It could keep going for as long as they wanted to. Now, to look at this behavior, we used uh, k-means cluster analysis, and we, again, are focusing on both time and accuracy. But here, instead of notions of just accuracy, we're actually taking signal detection uh, theory measures, very commonly known as true positive rate and the false positive rate. So we're looking at this at the, for the summaries, the accuracy there, and also the time spent, and again, the accuracy and time on the documents. And that's, those are the variables on which we're going to do, do our clustering all together. So, now, these are overall results for the 48 participants. Um, this is not the cluster analysis. This is to give you a, a taste for what you see. Oh, you, let's just take the whole population and compare it to the cluster group. And basically, on the summaries, we're going to see, oh, they seem to be what we would call fast and liberal. They only take about nine seconds to before they click on a summary. And by liberal, what we mean is, if in doubt, they're going to click on the summaries. They're operating in a manner which is very similar to I don't want to miss a relevant document, so I'm willing to click on non-relevant documents to avoid missing the relevant documents. Now, they are distinguishing between relevant and non-relevant documents here. So the false positive rate at 62%, so when they, it's a non-relevant summary, 62% of the time they're going to click on that thing. Um, for the relevant ones, 82% of the time they're clicking on them. So they are distinguishing, but they're very liberal in their bias towards what they're going to click on. 
For the documents, they also seem to be quite fast. I mean, they're only spending on average 26 seconds before they leave that page or have made a decision to save it. Um, but now their decisions are, are quite neutral. The true positive rate and the false positive rate are balanced. Now, we're going to cluster them into three groups. The paper has, other, has a clustering by two groups, and the paper has lots more details than this. Um, I encourage you to take a look at it or come talk to me. Now, the best performing group that uh, quite uh, outdoes the other groups combines a strategy of being very fast and liberal on the summaries with actually take, being quite fast but neutral again on the documents. So six seconds on the summaries, 20 seconds on the documents, and they really churn through and find the relevant documents the fastest. There are two slower performing groups, and they basically adopt opposite strategies. So the better of the two slower performing groups actually goes ahead and has a slow uh, evaluation of the summaries. They're taking 15 seconds in comparison to these six seconds. But now we also, besides just seeing them as being uh, slower, they're actually neutral in their decisions. Okay, They're actually balancing the their true positive rate and the false positive rate, and that's very interesting. But when they get to the documents, they're able to go very quickly. The other group, uh, is they're very fast on the summaries, but then when they get to the documents, they take 40 seconds, okay, approximately. So we really, between these two slower performing groups, see them basically allocating almost sort of the same amount of time, about 45 seconds for a summary and document total evaluation, but how they spend their time is quite different, okay? One group says, oh, I'm going to go really fast on the summaries, but then I have to spend quite a bit of time on the documents. And the other group says, nope, I'm going to spend quite a bit of time before I make my decision on which summary to click upon, but when I get to the document, I'm able to make that decision very quickly. And with that, I look forward to your questions later because we're taking them at the end of all of these talks. Perfect. Five minutes on the nose. He told me it would be five minutes on the nose. All right, so next up is uh, Jim Kim uh, with some work needed with Ms. Cross and David Smith. is going to be talking about evaluating an associate Browsing model by simulation. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm Jin Kim from UMass Amherst. Um, uh, my, my group is not typically associated with HCIR research, but uh, there I am. <laughs> 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 so um, since our talk about how we can improve our access to own documents, our own personal documents, our start by this simple question. What do you remember about your documents? So. Um, we usually, we usually don't have very good memory of our documents. And um, in that case, our memory is typically covered this way. And if, you can, if you're lucky, you can come up with a couple of keywords by which you can use keyword search interface to find the document, right? But unless you are this lucky, you'll not, you, you'll not be able to find it. But you may still remember some other information, which is association with this document and other documents. And in that case, and if the system supports uh, some sort of browsing between um, document to other document, uh, believe that you can use this. Um, you can start an interaction by keyword search and then uh, move to the target document by browsing. So this is the uh, interaction model we are proposing. And we use um, some, something like find similar kind of interface to um, evaluate this. Um, uh, interface interaction method, but um, and we did some user study uh, in other work, which I'll present uh, next week on CIKM conference. But today's talk should, uh, is focusing on so the, given that interaction model, how we can evaluate that by simulation, and I think that simulation is uh, important because it allows you to test your method with lots of variations in uh, system configuration and user user parameter. And for simulation, we first uh, propose some sort of problem 
uh, probabilistic user model, which is composed of uh, query generation and uh, uh, state transition between search and browsing, and um, link selection for uh, browsing. So, um, just to see, uh, so our model starts by um, search, and then user can click on the um, uh, list of the result if they want to browse, and then uh, they can uh, finish interaction by finding the target document. So I'll give you some more detailed interaction model. So we start by taking this target document, and our publishing user model takes the term, um, in this case, this James registration, uh, and use it for use it to initiate the search procedure. And if the search is not relevant at all, uh, it reformulate the query. But if the search looks reasonably relevant, which you can pair because we have the we can use the rank position of the tar original target documents, then um, it initiates a browsing by clicking one of the top results. And in any case, it, it, if you can rank the target document at top 10, it finishes the interaction. So this is the um, interaction model of probably some user model. Um, and the point and the hypothesis we evaluate using this uh, simulation technique is uh, two big parameters of user. The first is um, user's browsing behavior, which we um, divide into fan out and the breadth first versus depth first search approach. So if the user is browsing the, uh, so by fan out, I mean whether a user click one versus um, more than one uh, item per uh, result. And this uh, breadth first and depth first search is different by uh, the order in which they are browsed. So this is the behavioral part of the user model. And as for the knowledge part, we had three different levels of knowledge, which is random, informed, and the oracle. And um, we, since we have the uh, rank position of the target document, we can, uh, you can, we can model the user's knowledge of the um, this known item finding scenario. So I don't have time for evaluation uh, presentation uh, for deep uh, detail, but um, our overall results show that um, compared to the other user study that we performed. Uh, we found that browsing is uh, used and the, is uh, successful almost uh, at the same rate as the user study results that we did. Um, and the other thing that we found is when we looked at the success ratio of the browsing, um, we found some interaction between uh, users' um, uh, behavior and the users' le level of knowledge. I, I can tell you more about this when you come to my poster later. But the summary is that we uh, propose this associated browsing model and um, valuation by simulation. And I, I just want to uh, make a brief comment about this uh, ongoing work. So you can see that my previous week was sort of like very simplified version, but we want to incorporate uh, humans' uh, memory model to actually uh, more realistically simulate users' interaction with the system. Thanks. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. So next up is uh, Bill Coolis, who's going to talk about some work that he and I did uh, about visualizing search stages during the exploratory search session. Quick change here. See if we can do this. All right, so like Rob said, this is work that we did on um, trying to understand the stages of a search that people go through during an exploratory search session. Outline sort of the standard talk format. Um, this was specifically done when we were looking at, we were studying faceted library catalogs, and we've done a couple of studies on this. And the, the typical thing is we give, you know, the it's a sort of standard lab study where we give a, um, um, we give a uh, exploratory search task. We have them go run through about six of those. We, we've been using eye tracking and, and um, you know, using that to 
to collect data. In this particular case, what we were interested in understanding is, are there um, particular patterns, what's the overall distribution of time they spent in the various search stages of their search, and are there observable patterns? And I'll come back to what the stages are that we were looking at in just a minute. Um, just a little bit of background. The study was uh, 18 subjects, undergrads. Um, they were, we're having them do these exploratory searches where they were sort of grounded in writing an academic paper, early stage research, going to the library or using the library catalog to find, to find information. <laughs> we had them do six of those tasks. And then what we did is um, we, were, we were recording the, the gaze data. And then at the end of the session, we actually replayed the last two of their stages, of their searches. Um, and we, had the, we did a little retrospective interview where we, um, we replayed the, 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 search, the video of those searches at half speed and we overlaid the gaze data. So we could act, they could actually see what they were looking at, slow, slow motion. And then what we asked them to do is report at each, every 10 seconds or so, report what stage of the search they were in. And we captured that data. Uh, the full details of this study are in um, our JSIS paper. Um, this is an example of the exploratory task. The six, the, we used five stages, and the reason we did this is there's a number of different models of stages of search, search sessions. Uh, Marcinini's model is the one that sort of grew on a lot. Um, we had to collapse that down to something that was more usable for the end users, for the, for the searchers, because um, first of all, they didn't know, it was a lot of stages, we didn't, it was complex. And then the other is that they don't, the, the labels and the names, the, the, the stages and the models are not necessarily readily understandable to the end users. And so what we ended up doing is trying to collapse them and come up with more meaningful, more meaningful um, stages. And these were the five stages. Um, coming up with query terms, getting an overview, extracting, deciding what to do next in their search, and then deciding on a topic, which was the nominal search task. So when we did that, and then we um, basically summed up the amount of time that they spent in each stage of that task over the course of the search, you can see that in the extracting stage, they spent um, significantly more time. Uh, it turns out to be about 40% of their time was spent extracting, and then the other time was spent that roughly divvied up among the other stages. And then what we did, let's see if I can get this to work in one minute, is look at... Um, what we tried to do is visualize each stage, each search, and the sequence of stages that the user went through and present that in some visual way that gives you some way to look at an overview and drill down into the details. So, for example, if we look at, if I zoom out a little bit, um, you can start to see an overview of all the, there's about 30, 18, about 36 sessions total. Oh, we lost a couple, maybe 30. So. And um, you can see how the how some of the search searches were, you know, longer or shorter. Um, we saw some interesting patterns of, you know, most of them started with the query terms, not surprisingly. And then, um, but some of the some of the searches went, you know, through this query terms overview, query terms overview, um, deciding on a topic. Query terms overview, and so you can see these different patterns of how their search progressed. Some of them were very slower and more deliberate, perhaps. Others um, spent more time on the extracting phase. So th those are sort of some of the interesting patterns that we saw. And I'll stop there, but um, there's some interesting um, future work that we want to do sort of building on that. So come talk to us at our poster. Last but not least is Michael Cole. Uh, he's going to talk about uh, user domain knowledge and eye-movement patterns during search. Okay. Oh, it's kind of balanced there. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so what I'm going to focus on is uh, work that we've been doing that's uh, uh, developing a new methodology to take eye movement data directly from Toby eye tracking logs and really focus on analyzing the eye movement patterns. 
And what we're interested in, in particular, is focusing on modeling the process of information acquisition as the person's experiencing it during search. And the way in which we operationalize it is to focus on cognitive effort uh, that's associated with that. Uh, the connection with knowledge, uh, without getting into an awful lot of things, uh, the general idea is that words are indicative of concepts, and concepts are more or less the same as knowledge, and we leave aside questions of relationships between uh, rules and so on and so forth. Uh, but very importantly, the process of reading involves using knowledge in order to understand uh, the words that you're dealing with, and also to process the concepts that are involved, and both the acquisition of information and concepts that you're getting uh, from text that you're reading. So you can see that it's a very central element in uh, all aspects of search. So what's very important is to understand that the user knowledge actually controls interaction during search. It controls it both in the sense of selecting the words uh, that uh, a person chooses to read, and it also importantly imposes some cognitive demands in order to understand what's going on. So here are a couple of really key facts about eye movement. Uh, the first is, is that eye movements are cognitively controlled. Okay, you do not passively move your eyes around and process the information that comes in. Rather, you look where you want to look. And there are a number of studies that show generally that where you look depends upon what your current needs are. And we uh, can make the assumption that that holds for information search as well. Now, a really critical point and somewhat surprising point is that when eyes fixate on a particular location uh, with respect to reading, they remain fixed until you've acquired the meaning of the words at that point. Uh, studies have been conducted where you take the words away and people will continue to look at the word until they've acquired it. So words that are less familiar take longer. So this really tells us why uh, we think eye movement pattern analysis is extremely powerful. First is too obvious to mention you're not looking at it, you can't possibly acquire the information. But the second is, I think, really the uh, keystone here. And that is, is, if you consider one and two, you realize that there's a direct causal connection between the observations that you're making of people's eye movement patterns and cognitive processing states, and by extension, mental states. So that's really nice, because we can think now about how we can connect that with observable user behavior. So this is an example of people looking at a page. I've highlighted in green sequences where a person is actually reading. So the yellow dots are the fixations. And you have the isolated fixation points. You can see that there are three sequences where they're engaged in somewhat extended view. So what our methodology does is to take eye tracking logs on the front end that record the fixation information and then produce this representation of the reading experience. That is to say, grouping things together in these longer reading sequences and the shorter ones. Here are the four cognitive processing measures. If you come by later, uh, I'll be able to tell you a lot more detail about them. Reading speed, perceptual span, how long you're looking at it, and how many times you move backwards. There's a lot of empirical support for connections between each of these. Uh, here's a study. You've only seen this several times before. Uh, so the results that we have are that there are strong individual correlations between the level of domain knowledge and at least three of our cognitive effort measures. First is perceptual span, which is roughly the spacing of the fixations. And very interestingly, there's a lot of evidence showing that that's related to a conceptual processing bottleneck of human beings. Uh, second is how long, on average, you're looking at words. And then finally, and what we've built is uh, some regression and classification models, and we've had some success in being able to show uh, that uh, at least some predictive work. Uh, so main points, methodology, lots of grounding in empirical research, roughly 20 or 30 years in cognitive science, directly connected to the information acquisition process. Very nicely, it's completely domain independent. Nowhere have we talked about processing the content that's there. And also, as a follow-on, it's also culturally and individually independent. 
because it's driven by the user's experience how they're actually interacting with the information. Thank you very much for the Poodle Project. Okay, well, uh, thanks to all of our speakers. are tight enough on time that we're going to have to go any time for questions for these last five minute folks. But I really encourage you to uh, ask them during lunch and give them all the questions that you've been thinking about and holding back. Uh, we have one public service announcement that we're going to take a minute for. Uh, and then All right, so I prevailed upon my organizers to let me do one public, one little PSA. Um, HHS is proposing to change the rules for human subjects research. And um, they've had a the proposal out there, this is going to affect anybody in sort of on the academic side who's doing human subjects research. They've had a proposal out there for a while, they're looking for comments. Um, there's a number of promising things about the, the proposal. But uh, obviously, the devil's in the details in this rulemaking process. One of the things Marty Hurst, um, back in August, I think, sort of said, well, let's get make sure that the HCI researchers' voice is heard. So we've looked at that. There's a bunch of us that have developed, a, drafted a letter. It's gone through a few, several revisions. And it's now available, if you want to look at it and hopefully sign it, up here at this Google address. Um, and it's a, it's a summary. We couldn't tr address all the issues. Um, so we encourage you to look at the letter, read it. If you agree with it, please sign it. We've got seven. We've got about 100 HCI researchers. We're hoping that this makes an impact when they read their comments. Um, if you want to see the full proposal, it's available there. There's also a link to it from this page, so you don't have to remember that whole thing. Um, and we encourage you to read that and look at that.